Amen. So we're in Psalms chapter 5, picking it back up where we left off a few weeks ago. And uh, there's several things I'd like to point out here, but right out of, right out of the gate, I just want to point out uh, the strong warning about the flatterer that's in this chapter. If you look there in verse 9, it says, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. So, his tor of course, David's talking about uh, the very the bloody man, the deceitful man, uh, the foolish, the workers of iniquity, as he refers to them in verses 5 and 6. But he says of them that there is no faithfulness in their mouth. He says of them that their inward part is very wickedness. I mean, this is talking about very wicked people. To use such strong language as to say, their throat is an open sepulcher. You know, that's talking about like an open grave. You know, and he's not just saying they have bad breath, okay? He's talking about everything about these people is that they're just rotten to the core. You know, if you open up a grave, what do you find? You know, you find a rotten corpse. There's no life in it. It's nothing good. It's, it's, it's defiled. It's not anything you want anything to do with. And he's using this strong langu language to describe these people, having no faithfulness in their, in their mouth, being very wicked in the inward parts, and that their throat is an open sepulcher. But notice that last part that he kind of tags on there, and describes how they, uh, how they function or how they act or the, something that they're known for doing, they flatter with their tongue. So these are very wicked people, but yet they can say the right things. They can, they, the, the way that they work and what they do in order to work their deceit, in order, the way, in, in order to work their iniquity, is that they flatter with their tongue. And the Bible gives us a very strong warning throughout Scripture against those that would be flatterers. And we need to have our, have our guard up when it comes to flattery. Because, you know, we've seen people come and go through the church, and, you know, people come and go, that's just the nature of life. But sometimes when people are kind of go because they're told to go or end up going on a bad note, you know, I've seen a lot of people come in and be and, and, and try to do harm to the body of Christ that are no longer with us, even in our small assembly, that were flatterers. One of the things that they did is that they flattered with the tongue. And that's how they would deceive people, that's how they would trick people is that they would use their tongue to flatter people. And what, what are they doing when they do that? They're covering up all these other things. They're getting you so, you know, buffaloed with the fact that, you know, you're such a great this, and you're so wonderful, and you're so wise, and good-looking, and smart, and intelligent. And they're flattering you so that you won't notice the open sepulcher that they really are. You won't notice them for the worker of iniquity that they really are. So I want to kind of take a minute and just look at flattery real quick in the Bible. And, you know, one particular person that's warned against the flatterer is the young man. Okay, and if you would, go over to Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7. I'll read you from Proverbs chapter 2 as you go through over to Proverbs chapter 7. One of the people that is warned the most about the flatterer is the young man. <laughs> it says when in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 10, you're going over to chapter 7, When wisdom entereth into thine heart... And knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Discretion shall, shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward, forward things. So again, evil people are using their mouth. They're speaking. They're using their tongue to work iniquity. Who leave the paths of righteousness to walk in the ways of darkness. Who rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness of wickedness. You know, and it's hard for us sometimes to wrap our head around the fact that there's people like this in the world. That to them, it, it, they rejoice to do evil. It's not like they do evil, or, you know, it's not like they do bad things or bring harm to people and want to bring harm to the body of Christ just because they can't help themselves and they feel really bad about it. No, they rejoice to do it, the Bible says. They rejoice to do evil. They delight in the forwardness of the wicked. They enjoy doing wicked things. Whose ways are crooked and they are forward in their paths to deliver thee from the strange woman. You know, and that's not just talking about you know, the weird girl at school, the goth chick or whatever, you know, the emo, whatever they call them today. You know, the strange woman. It's talking about a, a woman that is foreign to you, right? Another man's wife, you know, someone you're not married to, someone who you don't have, uh, you know, the right to uh, have certain relationships with, right? That's what he's talking about, the strange woman. <laughs> to deliver thee from the strange woman, even the stranger, which doth what? Flattereth with her words which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God for house inclineth unto death. See how again this is all tied in with that open sepulcher? How so often when he's talking about the flatterer, about how these are, we're talking about dead people here, people that are associated with death and dying and harm. I mean, it's, it's, it goes hand in glove. 
So he's saying, look, the, the, the wisdom of God's word, the knowledge, when it's pleasant to your soul, the discretion, it's going to preserve you. It's going to keep you from what? From the strange woman who does what? Flatters with her words. <coughs> For her house inclined unto, inclined unto death and her paths unto the dead. Know that none that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. The Bible says that a whore is a deep ditch. That, you know, when people get involved in that sin, sometimes that's a very hard sin for people to get away from. If you think about a, a, a deep ditch, a narrow ditch, you know, anyone that's been down in a ditch, you know, I remember I worked in excavation for several years, or if you've ever done any kind of underground utility work, if you've ever been down in a deep ditch, you know, a lot of times, if you don't have a ladder, it's, it's really hard to get out of. And that's what he's saying here is like, you know, these women, they're, they're, they go down into the, they're, they're, they inclineth unto death, none that go in unto her return again. It's very hard to get away from that. That's why there's such a stern warning here. And what is it that you have to look out for? What is it that you have to discern? What is it that you have to have the wisdom and understanding to look out for? It's the fact that she's going to flatter with her words. <clears throat> that's what it says again in Proverbs chapter 7. If you and look there in verse 1, it says, my son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live as my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. You know, you want to have a relationship, you know, with, with a, you know, of course, this is, being, this is wisdom being personified as a woman. You know, that's the only, that's the only uh, a female companionship that, that the young man needs, is, is wisdom, the knowledge of God's word. This is a good you know, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm using that, I'm speaking, you know, at using that as kind of a, an illustration. But I'm just saying, look, you know, we all, you want to have a relationship, have a relationship with God. You want to have, you know, a relationship that's going to benefit you. Have a relationship with wisdom. Make her your sister. Call her your sister. Call her your kinswoman. Not the whore, not the loose, you know, girl, not the girl that's running around town and, 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 and running around with all the guys and, you know, and is known and has a reputation. And look, guys shouldn't be that way either. You know, I don't want to get up here and act like we have this double standard, but the Bible condemns whores and whoremongers. Those that would, you know, fornicators in general. Again, okay, I don't want to go off on that, but don't get me wrong, there's not a double standard here. That's not right, you know, for guys to act one way and say that the girls can't. It's, it's wrong for both of them to go out and commit fornication, period. But the warning is to the young man to look out for the young woman who has forsaken the God of her youth and to not uh, uh, and to not be taken in by what? By her flattery. It says in verse 5 that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. <clears throat> you stay there in Proverbs uh, chapter 7. It says in Proverbs chapter 6, My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. Kind of like we talked about this morning, about the need to read the Bible. Why? Because that is the light that we have that shines in a dark place. And he's saying, keep these things. Why? Verse 24, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Okay, now the Bible talks a lot about flattery, but so often it's associated with a strange woman with a woman with bad intentions who wants to corrupt a young man. It says in verse 25, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids, for by a means of a whorish woman a man is brought to a piece of bread. You're still there in Proverbs chapter 7. If you look again, uh, verse 6, it says, <coughs> For at the window of my house I looked through my casement, and beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding. So it's a young man who hasn't taken heed to everything that we just read about binding the God's commandments you know, upon, on, on thy fingers, putting them before your eyes, doing all these things, you know, keeping his father's commandments, not forsaking the law of his mother, binding them continually upon his heart, tying them about his neck, you know, and letting it lead him when he goes, and letting it speak to him when he awakes. Instead, this is the person that's forsaken all that. This is a young man that has put off all of that. And now he's considered what? A, to be among the simple ones. And what does it mean to be simple? To be stupid. To bring it in the modern vernacular. He's dumb. He's ignorant. He doesn't have knowledge. He doesn't have understanding. I discerned among the youths a man void of understanding. You know, he's just wandering through life, 
just assuming that everything is okay and that no ill is going to come to him. And it says in verse 8, and it's interesting to pay attention to the details here. We'll come back to this, but in verse 8 it says, Passing through the street near her corner, he went the way to her house. So keep in mind, who is seeking who in this story? The young man's going out, and he knows where she is. You know, you can, it's really easy to go find the floozy, right? It's really easy to go find the, you know, the, the whorish woman. She's out there. She's not hard to find. But the Bible says that, you know, that the, 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 the woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised, that her price is far above rubies. Who can find a virtuous woman, right? The Bible says that's what's hard to find. There's nothing special about the whorish woman. They're, they're a dime a dozen. That's why he says, don't let her be taken in by, you know, with her eyelids. <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, what does that mean? You know, don't, you know, all the makeup that they put on and they doll themselves up. Because you know what? All that comes off at some point. <laughs> you know, and it's a different creature sometimes, right? You know, don't let that, because there's the basic, and I'm not saying there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but I'm just saying this, that, you know, beauty is skin deep. And if you're going to get involved in somebody having a relationship, you better make sure that's not just about looks, that there's some real character there that there's some real redeeming value besides just that the way a person looks. Now, they're not be taken with the eyelids. But he's saying, look, uh, you know, he saw among the youths a young man void of understanding passing through the street near her corner. You know, basically, when, and when you have a corner, when you're hanging out in a corner, that's something whores do, right? And everyone, you know, you can, you can find out where that district is. You know, there people know certain corners, certain parts of town. That's where that kind of thing goes on. And that's what he knew. So he's flirting with sin. He's kind of going over there. Verse 9, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. So it's not like he's just going by there once. He's kind of hanging around, going back and checking out. Is she here? Is she gone? He's seeking her. Okay? And I'm going to get to make a point here in a minute. But look at verse 10. It says, and behold, there met him a woman with the entire harlot and subtle of heart. It's interesting that it says she had the entire harlot. It doesn't say she is a harlot. Meaning that you can dress like a harlot and not actually be one. That's another sermon. Verse 11, she is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she is without, now in the streets and lieth and wait at every corner. She's easy to find, dime a dozen. She's in every corner. So she caught him and kissed him and with an impudent face said unto him, I have made peace offerings with me. This day I have paid my vow. Oh, she's a Christian, right? She's spiritual, right? That means nothing. It says in verse uh, 15, Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. Now, is that what happened to the story? Was it her that was going by his corner, going to where she was and coming back in the evening and the twilight and the black and dark night? Was he the one that was going out? She says she diligently sought him, but do you think that's really what was going on? No, that's not at all what was going on. <laughs> she said, I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrhs, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. Now, what was it that she said that was so fair? Was it when she described the bed? Was it when she described the fact that the good man, the husband, the dad, whatever that relationship is, is gone? No, the, the, the much fair speech there is when she says to him, I came forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face. I have found thee. She's making it out to him like, oh, I, you're the only one for me. You know, I'm seeking you. And she just finds him instantly, you know, lands a, a big kiss on him, right? And, you know, if, 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 if here's the thing, if a girl's that quick to do that with you, she's quick to do that with anybody. There's nothing special about this guy. She just found him. He just happened to be there. And if any other guy had been there, she probably would have said the exact same thing. The point I'm making is this. She's using flattery to get this guy. She's saying, oh, I've diligently sought thee. I've looked for you. You're the only one. You see how she's using flattery to get him to come and commit fornication or even adultery, potentially. We don't know exactly what, who the goodman was. But it says in verse 21, with her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With flattering, the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Now that's an interesting picture, isn't it? That this guy that's being taken in and led along by this whorish woman to go commit this, you know, adulterous or act or fornication or whatever is like an ox going to the slaughter. 
like some cow just doesn't even know he's about to get punched in the head, have his skin ripped off, gutted, and just turned into burger meat or whatever. But that's, what's, that's the picture here. He's going to the slaughter. <coughs> that's a very strong warning in the word of God about going out and committing fornication. And on the world paints a totally different picture, doesn't it? Oh, everyone's doing it. Do what feels good. Nothing's going to just, as long as you're safe about it, nothing bad can happen. The Bible says you're going to the slaughter. That's what it says. You know, and if you've been around long enough, you know people that get involved in these relationships and go out and commit the sin of fornication. They end up with diseases they didn't want. They ended up with children they didn't want. They ended up paying, you know, or they, the girl ends up getting abortion and now they got the blood on their hands, so on and so forth. You don't know what could happen. All kinds of terrible things could happen. At the moment, it didn't seem like that. I mean, if he looked and he's getting let along and just saw a giant meat grinder where she was walking him towards, he probably would have stopped what he was doing. But the world isn't going to paint that picture. But guess what? The Bible does. And the way, the way she gets him to go to such a, uh, you know, a, a, a terrible end as, you know, like a, like a bird hastening to the snare that knoweth not it is for his life. The way she gets him to do that is through flattery. I saw the, I diligently looked for the wicked person who just out there to maim, hurt, destroy, fulfill her ungodly lusts, and she'll use flattery of speech to do it. That's how they work. And the Bible gives us many other examples of the flatterer. And, the way, and, and this is just one example. And I decided to kind of go to this one because that really is the strongest warning I find in Scripture about flattery is to the young man concerning the whorish woman. But we could also take note of the fact that the false prophet is also a flatterer. And if you would, go over to, uh, go over to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. <coughs> the Bible says in Proverbs 20, He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secret, Therefore, meddleth not, meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. So the guy that flatters with his lips is the guy that goes about as a talebearer. You know, he's a gossip. He's a busybody. And he reveals secrets, right? Sometimes maybe he knows something that nobody else knows. Something's been told him in confidence. Or he overheard something that was spoken in confidence. And he's got some juicy bit of gossip you know, he's going to go out and he's going to try and tell that to somebody else. He's going to go forth as a tail bearer. But here's the thing, not every, you know, you usually know when you're hearing something that's really none of your business. I think we all kind of know that instinctually. When someone says, hey, did you hear about someone? You instantly know, this is none of my business. You know, and if someone just came up to you and was just said, hey, let me just tell you what's going on in so-and-so's household. Let me just tell you what's going on with so-and-so. Let me just tell you what I heard. You know, they're not, they wouldn't just come right out with it is what I'm saying. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll feel you out, and they do it through flattery. You know, they'll try to say, hey, you know, I, 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 well, here's the big one, right? They try to do it like, you know, so-and-so really needs a lot of prayer right now. You know, they do it under the guise of, of, of they, I'm just, you know, I think you should know how to pray for so-and-so. And then they just, you know, tell you all of this dirt on them or whatever. And that's why it says, meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. You know, the guy that's going to flatter you with his lips, kind of butter you up, it's just, he's waiting, you know, he's buttering you up so that he can drop some bomb on you. You know, he's, he's, he, he's trying to get you to receive some kind of information that you otherwise might not. He's trying to flatter you. And he said, the Bible says, don't even meddle with this person. That's, you know, we need to identify flatters and know it when it's happening to us. And the people that are really good at it, they, they can do it, and you won't even realize it's happening. Now, a lot of times when you preach like this, people, they get on guard. And then anytime anyone says, hey, I like that tie, it's like, you flatterer, you false prophet, what are you up to? You know, they, it's like they start, there's nothing wrong with a genuine compliment if it's from the heart, it's sincere. You know, you say something, you pay somebody a compliment. But we all know when it's over the top. When someone says, boy, Brother Corbin, you look like you're losing a lot of weight. I'm like, I haven't lost weight. And I'm you know what I mean? Like, people say things like, that's a great tie. You're thinking, this tie has a huge stain on it. Right or whatever they they're just going over the top. They're just saying, "Oh, that sermon was the greatest sermon I've ever heard." And it's like, "Come on, that that's that." There's no way that's true. Why are you flattering like that? You know, you know the difference there, right? And the Bible says you need to learn to identify the flatterer, and when you do that, not to meddle with them. Say this person is like handle them with kid you know, with 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 don't handle them at all. Actually, get away from it. They should be avoided. Are you there in Proverbs? Or excuse me, Romans chapter sixteen. Did I have you go there? Yeah. Romans 16, it says in verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. 
You know, that's a real important thing that we need to understand, is that people that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and, and people always want to make it, well, it's just about if you preach false doctrine. No, you know what? If, if you cause division, if someone comes in the church, maybe they're not even pre preaching false doctrine, but they're not endeavoring to keep the bond of, of unity and the spirit of peace in the church, if they're just going around causing trouble, you know, driving a wedge between people, the Bible says to avoid them, that they, they should be put out of the local church. That's what I believe. That's one way you can interpret that passage. If someone's going to come to church and just be a troublemaker, I don't care if they've got all their doctrinal ducks in a row, they're out of here. Because the Bible says to uh, mark them, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. And you know what? The, the, the unity of the local church is a doctrine that we are to keep. That is one of the doctrines, to, to, to uh, you know, live in, in one accord, to have peace with all men, and to love the brotherhood. Right? So that's kind of a separate subject, but I thought I would, you know, I always like to mention that because you never know when you might need to call on that scripture. But it says here in verse 18, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. So it's talking about like someone who's a false prophet. They, they're just, you know, sometimes these people, they want to get into church because they know, they think, oh, you know what? It could be a real cush position. There's money coming into the plate. You know, I could just go along, you know, I could just preach things I don't necessarily believe. And you know what? They, how do they do it? They, they, they do it to serve their own belly and they do it to do what? And how do they do it? By good words and fair speeches, right? They deceive the hearts of the simple. You know, people who are not aware, like the young man who was among the simple ones, that there are people out there with bad intentions, you know, to commit fornication, to come into churches and teach false doctrine, or to just serve their own belly, and they all use the same method. Fair speeches, flattering words. They go together, and they deceive the hearts of the simple. They use fair speeches, which is exactly what the Bible said back in Proverbs of the strange woman. Through her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. So it's not just, you know, the wicked fornicator, you know, the person who just wants to indulge in sin, but even false prophets use this. That before they're going to just come out with their stupid false doctrine, before they're going to come in and try and draw away disciples after them, you know, they're going to go along. They're going to go along and they're going to use fair speeches and good words. They're going to say all the right things and it's going to sound real good. I mean, think about the false prophets of today. Some of the big names, right? Joel Olstein. Sorry if that's your hero. And the guy's a false prophet, okay? And the Bible says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers the false prophets. Right? So when you see a guy who's being praised and lifted up by the world, Larry King, Seven Amon, Oprah's talking, you know, all these people, and the world lifts him up, and he's got that perfect smile, you know, and he's just this great guy, everybody loves him. He's, pro he's a false prophet, and you can hear the, the things that he says. But do you think he gets up and just rants? Is, is, can you see, is, is, is Joel Osteen just getting up and ripping face down there in Houston and just saying all these hard things? No. It's all, it's all you know, your best life now. You know, God loves you. God's not mad at you. It's grace, 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 grace. And I'm all for grace, but there's a whole lot more than that to, to God. And we want the whole picture of God, who he is, the good, the bad, not that there is any bad, but you know what I'm saying. All the parts that we don't necessarily want to hear about God. Those are the parts that we probably need to hear the most. But you're not going to hear it in Joel Osteen's church because he's a false prophet. And what does he use? He uses good words and fair speeches. And he deceives the hearts of the simple. People who don't even understand that this is how these people operate. They sneak in, they preach lies, and they do it all under the mask of Good words, fair speeches. And what are they doing? They're flattering their congregation. They're flattering the people that listen to them. And if people don't understand the strong warning against flattering the Bible, they're going to be taken in and, and be deceived by this. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. The Bible says in Proverbs 20 man, 29, A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. You know, and, the, and people that, that, that turn on the pastor that turn on the church, that attack that from within, you know, what they've done is they, they, they lay a trap through flattery. They come into a church, they say all the right things, they, get a, you know, they flatter a bunch of people, get them on their side, invite them all over to their house, bring lots of good gifts whenever they visit. I mean, we had one you know, group couple come down here every time they came down. And I'm not against people bringing things to eat, but it was like every time they came down, they had to get all these decadent, you know, the, the salamis and the cheeses and the crackers and, and all this stuff. And then they always were having people over. And, 
at their place and these big barbecues and so on and so forth. And they were flattering people so that when they finally decided to spring their trap, hopefully they, could, they were hoping to have drawn a following after them. That's what the Bible says. A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. That's what's really going on with the flatterer. He's trying to trap you. He's trying to snare you. Look at the, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. Talking about false prophets. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom uh, the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Reprobates. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity. There they are, using their words against swelling words of vanity. Very flowery speeches. They allure through the lust of the flesh through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. So again, you see how these false, witness, or these false prophets, they are using what? Great swelling words of vanity. They're using flattery. Look, the Bible gives us a very strong warning about people that are flatterers. Because people who use flattery, you know, they're spreading a nair, snare for their feet. They're, they're, they're told, we're told not to meddle with them. Why is that? It's because they're wicked people. They're wicked people. I mean, Second Peter chapter two. These are, you know, these are the great. These are uh, uh, these are the waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. For whom is reserved the darkness of blackness forever? I mean, these are wicked. The Bible doesn't just say that about every lost sinner. These are people that have bad intentions and they use flattery to work uh, their works of iniquity. They're wicked, and that's why. And, and here's the thing about that: God hates wicked people. God hates wicked people. And, you know, to get up even say that in, in, in modern America, to say that God would actually hate somebody, that, you know, oh, that, well, hate is such a strong word. Yeah, but so is love. And so is hate. And they're natural human emotions. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend that there aren't things I don't hate. And I'm not going to sit here and, and, you know, and what kind of a Baptist preacher would I be if I got up in here and told you, oh, God doesn't hate anybody. When the Bible's full of God saying, I hate them. Right. Saying he hates certain people. I mean, it's right here in our passage, of, of, in, if you're still there, in Psalms chapter 5. <clears throat> Look at verse, uh, Psalms chapter 5, verse 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hainest all the workers of iniquity. I mean, it's just there in black and white. He thou shalt so destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the dis bloody and deceitful man. He says, I'm going to hate them. I will abhor them. You think, I mean, to count it an abomination, abhor something. You know what it is to abhor something? That's like when, you know, someone tries to pass you a dish that you don't like or something. I abhor it. You know, I have picky eaters at home. There's some things they abhor, you know. We all have, probably have those children. You try to give them a specific food. That's what's on the menu tonight. I abhor this. You know, they're trying to gag it down. It's so bad. But that's what God is saying about these people. He abhors them. He hates them. Look, God, you know, we need, we need to be on our guard against flatterers because they're wicked people and God hates wicked people. And he hates them for a reason. Well, I don't know. That's only one verse. Well, how about Psalms 11? It says in verse 5, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. You know, and here's the thing. God hates the right people. You know, and I'm going to hate whoever God hates. And if God hates wicked people and them that love violence, I'm going to hate them too. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone and in horrible tempest, this shall be the portion of their cup. So the Bible says that God is going to pour out his indignation upon them. He said, well, I don't know if God, you know, I know that, that, you know, that's just David. He's being melodramatic. Okay, how, explain hell then. Explain to me hell. T tell me God doesn't hate anybody and then explain hell to me. I mean, I, there's some people I hate or have hated at least. I don't think I'd ever try to stick him in an oven for eternity. But that's exactly what God does to people. He throws them in hell forever. How is that not hate? You know, if I did that to you, you wouldn't say I love you. Oh, that was very nice of you, Brother Corbin. I can tell how much you love me by roasting me in fire for all of eternity. But that's exactly what God does. So if God doesn't hate anybody, explain hell. I mean, that's the perfect picture of God's hatred. Nothing could be more clear that, that God hates than hell itself. So it just, it's just a strange world that we're living in, in even in Baptist churches, where to, to even insinuate that God would hate anybody would get you run out on a rail, that people just are aghast at that. God hates somebody? Like, yeah. Well, God, I thought God loved everyone. Yeah, loved the world. Past tense. God at one point loves everybody, but there comes a point with, with God, you know, once you're in hell, it's kind of too late. 
But that's a whole other you know, sermon, really. But we need to take heed to the flatter because they're wicked people. God hates wicked people. God is going to destroy them. That's what it says there in verse 6. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. These are the same people that are flattering with the tongue. God is going to destroy them. You know, and, that, and we should desire that too. That's what, that's what David's desiring. Look at verse 10. Destroy them, O God. <laughs> He's saying, do it. He's saying, destroy them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. It's not that David's upset that they've offended him. It's because they've transgressed against God. You know, there's a big difference between mine enemy and the Lord's enemy. You know, everybody that cuts you off in traffic isn't all of a sudden God's enemy, you know, you know damned to hell for all eternity. You know, you, that's probably more on us than them, right? Everybody that we have an, a problem with is not necessarily God's enemy. That's important to understand. But look, when somebody has made themselves the enemy of God, I say destroy them. I say, you know what? Let them fall by their own counsels. So they want to reject God, reject the Bible, not only reject it, but then actively work against it. You know what? Destroy them. Let them fall by their own counsels. Let them, let them get what they deserve. That's what David's saying. And amen to that. You know, that's the attitude we should have as well. But, you know, th th here's the thing. Let me kind of wrap it up here. If you would, uh, well, just go back to Psalms chapter 5. He says in Psalms chapter 3, because, you know, this psalm isn't all just destroy the wicked. You know, but that's a big part of it, right? And this understanding that there are wicked people that God hates and he is going to destroy ought to affect our behavior, okay? Let's look at how it affected David's behavior, okay? He said in verse 3, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. So it starts out kind of sweet, the psalm, right? <laughs> But toward, you know, a few verses in, he's, destroy them, you know, but he starts out, hey, God, I'm going to pray to you. You're going to hear my voice in the morning. So it sounds kind of, oh, this is one of those psalms, right? Just a nice, heartfelt psalm from David. But notice why he says this in verse 4. He says, my voice shalt out here in the morning. In the morning, I will direct my prayer unto thee, and we'll look up. Verse 4, here's the motive behind David's prayer. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, Neither shall evil dwell with thee. Look, David understand that God hates the bloody and deceitful man. God under, or David understood that God is going to destroy wicked people and therefore in his own life determined not to become a wicked person. You know, it's really easy to condemn everybody else, but you know, we need to make sure that we're not getting ourselves into a place where we're going to receive the chastening of God either. You know, the Christian, I know we're saying, once we're saved, we're always saved. I'm not saying that, that God is going to send us into hell. But God will punish us on this earth as God's children. You know, a, a Christian, a child of God, even themselves, can behave in a wicked way. To the point where God even has to deal with them harshly. And that's the motive behind David's prayer here. Yeah, he's talking about the fact that he's going to destroy them, that he's going to abhor them, and, that, and he's desiring it, and he's, he's calling them out for what they are. But he's saying, My prayer shalt thou hear in the morning, for thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. He's saying, you know what? I'm going to pray so that I can keep myself right. Make sure I keep myself out of the judgment of God. You know, and, and it's great that we have the understanding that you know, God's going to destroy the wicked. And it's great if we agree with God on that and say, yeah, let them fall by their own counsels. But let's slow, up, slow down a minute and really think about what the psalm is saying and, and understand that we need to turn that inward sometimes. And pray like David prayed. You know, and, and ask God to... to, to to, to know my thoughts and try my reins and see if there be any wicked way in me. Because we don't want to be hypocrites. You know, this should affect our behavior. Thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, therefore I will lift up my voice in prayer in the morning. <coughs> you know, David's motive to pray is so that he would not be displeasing to the Lord. You know, I know we should always be praying, you know, for the things that we have need of. You know, the Bible tells us that, you know, that we ought, we ought to, you know, if we have need of anything, that to, to cast all our care upon him, to come boldly before the throne of grace to, to, grace to find help in, in, in time of need. But, you know, part of our prayer life should be, examine me, God. Help me to get the sin out of my life. Help me not to be a wicked person. Help me to live 
a godly, chaste, pure life that's pleasing to you because thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. That's a good reason to pray. You know, this psalm should, you know, affect this understanding that there are wicked people in the world that we need to have our, our guard up about and that God is going to destroy them. This should affect our behavior. One, it should cause us to, to pray with the right motives. But you know what? It, it should also cause us to be faithful to the house of the Lord. And well, that's what it did for David. He said in verse 6, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all the workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. But as for me, I'm just going to stand on the sideline and, and, and say, rah, rah, rah. And just, you know, no, that's not what he said. He said, as for me, I will come into thy house. And the multitude of thy mercy and thy fear, I will worship toward thy holy temple. He's saying, look, I know you're going to destroy wicked people. Therefore, I'm going to pray in the morning. But not only that, I'm going to get in church. I'm going to be found in thine house. You know, and by the way, you say, well, that's the Old Testament. He's talking about the temple. He's talking about uh, you know, the, the house of the Lord. But that's the New Testament church today. That's what it says in, in, in 1 Timothy. It says, uh, if I tarry long, 1 Timothy 3.15, that thou mayest know how to, uh, thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. So what is the church, what is the house of God today? It's the church of the living God. You know, you're in the house of God today. Right now, you're sitting in it. And look, what David is showing us in this psalm is that it's, it's great to have the understanding that God is going to destroy wicked people, but it ought to affect our behavior and how we conduct ourselves. One, in prayer, and two, in faithfulness to the Lord's house. You know, we should be in church. Because I'll tell you what, being in church is, is one, it's like, it's one of the, it's, it's, it's one of the, just the cornerstones of the Christian life. I mean, it's, it's the church for which Christ died and shed his blood for the local church. Why wouldn't he want you in it as his child? It's, it's what God has given us as, as the, the tool to spread the gospel to the entire world is the local church. It, the, it, it's the tool by which we are edified and made perfect in Christ until his appearing. God has given us you know, the local church for our own edification. And we need to be in it. And if we're not in it, I'm telling you, we're, we're missing something in the Christian life. There's a lot of things. In fact, I'll just say this. There's nothing that I, can't, that I, can, that I, uh, that I preach that you can't get on your own. But chances are, it's going to take a lot longer. You know, the, the local church accelerates our growth as Christians. And you know what? God just, the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of them is. You know, as you, even, you know, even as you see the day approaching, we have to be gathered even more and more together, the Bible says. <clears throat> it ought to affect our behavior, this psalm. That's what it did for David. He saw things as they were. The wicked, a holy God that destroys wickedness, punishes foolishness, and he said, I don't want anything to do with that. Let me pray and let me get in the house of God. Let me live a Christian life. That's what he's saying here. David was obedient to the Lord's will. And that's what really I think this psalm is about. That's what we see here. Is that David has the right motives <laughs> and he becomes, he has the right motives and he's faithful to God. And if you look there in verse 8, and here it says, Lead me. O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies, make thy way straight before my face. So it's interesting there, you know, he has this desire, this is David's desire, is to be led of God. You know, in any honest Christian, you know, that should be all of our desire, is to be led of God, that we're walking in the ways of the Lord, that we're walking in him in all pleasingness, that we're being pleasing to the Lord, we're being faithful to the Lord, that our ways are pleasing him, that we're being led of him. Because if we're led of God, you know, our foot's not going to slide. We're not going to trip and stumble and fall. But notice there, he's saying, Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. Look, David understood that in order to be led of God, he had to walk in God's way. He didn't say, Lead me, O Lord, in the direction that I want to go. Lead me, O Lord, to do the things that I want to do. He said, Lead me, O Lord, and he said, Make thy way straight before my face. He wanted to walk, and he understood that in order to follow God, he had to walk in God's way, not in his own way. And that's what we need to understand tonight, is that we have to have the right motives, and we have to be faithful to God if we want him to make his ways evident before us. If we want to know that we're being led of God, well, then you have to walk in God's ways. And you know what? You say, well, why is that? Why is that so important? Why, 
you know, I mean, going to church, you know, is it really that important? Is walking with God and being faithful to God, you know, praying and getting the center of my life, is it really that important? Well, you know, there is a lot to miss out on. It's right here in the psalm. Look at verse 11. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. I mean, he's just talking about, you know, let them trust that, be, let them rejoice, let them shout for joy, let them be joyful in thee. Right? So these are people that have a lot of joy in their life. And, and here's the thing, if we're not, not going to walk with the Lord, if we're not going to follow God, if we're not going to be faithful to the house of God, if we're not going to pray and examine our motives and, and get right with God, we will not have joy. You know, you might have some temporal pleasure in this life. Maybe circumstances will be nice and things will be convenient, but there'll be no real lasting joy outside of God for the Christian. It's just not there. Everything else, will, with, I don't care how good and pleasant it seems, it will become vain and dull and boring as everything else and empty. But those that put their trust in me, they rejoice. Those that say, I'm just going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to be faithful to the Lord. I'm going to serve Him. They end up being the ones that rejoice. They end up being the ones that ever shout for joy. They end up being the ones that are joyful in thee. There's a lot of joy to be had. So we can blow this off, but you know what? We're missing out on a lot. There's a lot to miss out on. Verse 12, For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, wilt thou compass him as a shield. And he's saying, look, basically in the psalm that there are many deceitful, wicked flatters that you know, are out there in the world that are going to be punished. And we need protection from them. And that's found only in Christ. It's found only in God. And really, you know, <laughs> when it comes down to it, God is asking very little in return compared to what he's offering. I mean, think about what God is offering. Protection from the wicked, joy, peace, all the, being led of God not letting your foot, you know, protecting you from your enemies, not letting your foot slide, all these things. He's protecting them. He's giving them joy. God is giving so much and asking so little in return. He's saying, well, can you just pray and, and get the sin out of your life? Can you just pray and not be wicked? Can you just follow me, set my ways before your face, be faithful to the house of the Lord, and in return, God's just going to pour out blessings. To me, that sounds like a pretty good deal. So, you know, as we're coming into the new year, maybe we need to think about that. Maybe when you think about getting in the house of God, working on our prayer life, and above all things, you know, you know, tonight what we saw probably the most is the fact that there, we need to be on our guard as Christians. And understand that we're not just going to coast through the Christian life unscathed. That there are wicked people out there, and you know what? Just mark it down right now. If you're going to be faithful to the house of the Lord, if you're going to follow God, if you're going to set His ways before you, you're going to run into opposition, and they're not going to come to you you know, with the you know, enemy tattooed on their forehead. They're going to be subtle. They're going to be conniving. They're going to be crafty. But you know how you can pick them out real quick? It's flattery. Flattery. And that's something we need to be on our guard about. But we also should let all that affect our own motives and cause us to, to examine our own selves and our own hearts and make sure that, you know, we're doing things the right way so that we won't be on the, you know, the, the judgment end of God, but rather the blessing. And we gain a lot for giving up very little. Let's go ahead and pray.